Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Natalie Brillen, co-founder of Ethical Creators. At Ethical Creators, we aim to instill content creators with the knowledge, skills, and confidence needed to accurately and authentically advocate for sustainability issues. The inaugural Ethical Creator Summit, our free digital training offering for creators, will take place on the last two Fridays of May, May 21st and May 28th, and is now open for signups on our website, ethicalcreators.org. Um, we're so pleased today to have three illustrious panelists joining us for our panel at the FIT Changemakers Conference. Um, and our panel called Using Social Platforms for Change is all about using the power of social media to encourage and mobilize the systemic change we need to see in today's world. Look, the current social media landscape is one of accountability and responsibility. In response to a cultural shift towards creator accountability in 2020, consumers are calling on creators to advocate for social causes and to pursue meaningful, authentic partnerships. The power of social media to move the needle on issues of um, on issues like this is of huge importance. As the climate crisis intensifies and injustices pervade our systems, there are growing numbers of content creators who refuse to be complacent. On social media, one post by one person can reach and influence millions of people. So let's talk about that influence. There's a growing subset of creators that we're calling ethical creators. Today, we'll discuss who they are, how they use their platforms and how they think they and others are evolving and how to use their platforms. Ultimately, today we wanna to answer the question, do creators have a responsibility to harness their influence for good and how can they best do it? So my panelists today have a combined reach of over 1.1 million uh, followers on Instagram alone. Blair, Sophia and Duena are all creators who harness their influence for good. I'll do some brief introductions and then we'll dive right into the discussion, which we're really excited to have today. So first of all, Sophia. Sophia Lee is a multimedia journalist and film director. Her mission is to humanize issues such as the climate crisis and social justice into digestible and accessible news, cutting through the content pollution. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you for being with us. Next up, we have Blair. Blair Amani is a historian, author, social activist, public speaker, educator, and influencer. Her work centers women and girls, global black communities, and the LGBTQ community. Thank you, Blair, for being with us today. And then finally, we're joined by Duanya Tsiobanu. She's a fashion influencer and model known for her dedication to sustainability and work on various sustainability initiatives. And she's a recent graduate of Cambridge University's sustainability platform. Welcome, Doña. Thank you for being with us. So I'll dive right in with the questions. Um, first, Blair, I'd love to hear from you. Why did you start your social media presence and why? And please share how that purpose and the content has changed over time. Absolutely. So I had built up over a period of five years, um, 50,000 followers. And I was really proud of that. Um, and then, uh, as we know, there were great social uprisings during 2020. And as an educator uh, whose offerings were primarily around historical context, anti-oppression work, anti-racism work, and intersectionality theory, um, I had been under the impression that I would always kind of have a smaller platform. Um, but it turns out that my offerings were great. Uh, it's just and not too niche, actually, uh, but that the uh, visibility wasn't quite there yet. And literally overnight, I went from 50,000 followers to 150,000 followers. And let me tell you, I almost bruised my eyes rubbing them and trying to like make sure I wasn't, you know, pinching myself to make sure this was real. Because I had dreams about this, right? But it had never been a reality until that moment. Um, and my peers had told me that one day, you know, it would kind of, I would have my rising star. And so I really tried to step into that moment. It's horrible when you go viral uh, or you gain notice because your community is suffering. And I think right now a lot of, uh, of our Asian American and AAPI uh, you know, siblings are going through this right now. But once that happens, we have to sometimes recognize what we can do to move forward and step into that. Uh, and I really have taken it as a privilege and an honor and a responsibility. And so I've continued to, you know, turn out my lessons and really adapt to being online. But it's also being mindful of the fact that when I was figuring out what I wanted to be when I was a kid, this wasn't even a job yet. Teaching 400,000 people on the internet, like that sounds ridiculous. But that's what I do every day. Um, and so I call my followers smarties and I just try to make sure that everything is at a fifth grade level and really trying to remove indie con any 
and really trying to remove any condescension from it and really any ego from it. Doesn't mean I don't get frustrated when I put out a lesson and I've answered something in the slides or in the comments or in the caption and somebody asked that exact same question, I still get frustrated. But I have to remember that at one point, I didn't even know everything that I'm educating about. And that if I can meet people where they are, then we can have more brains thinking about issues of systemic injustice and fighting forward for it. I've also been able to become an influencer over these past six months. And so I'm excited to talk about today what it means to um, really monetize your platform and simultaneously uphold ethics and values. Thank you, Blair. And I've noticed with your um, some of your sessions, you've also been inviting guests on who are experts in the area that you're talking about, which I think has been really wonderful to share your platform in that way. Um, Sophia, how about you? Why did you start your social media presence and why and how has it changed over time? Uh, thank you, Natalie. And um, Blair, I loved what you said about um, not bringing your ego in or using words that are accessible because sometimes language in itself is are triggering and polarizes us. If you don't understand what white supremacy or systemic racism or even climate justice means, you're immediately can be turned off by the content, but you allowing people to access it from a language standpoint is super powerful. Um, I started my social media presence like probably any other millennial, uh, had a Facebook, had a MySpace, you know, had all of those platforms growing up. And then I actually was on Instagram, like they launched in 2010. I think I was on it in 2011, just because um, photography was like a big passion of mine in school. And it's evolved because when I, um, I used to be the former entertainment media editor at American Vogue. And I was part of the core team that really launched AmericanVogue.com. Vogue's social and digital voice. And when I was there for four years, we went from, you know, Vogue's Instagram having a couple, like tens of thousands of followers to, I don't even know what it is now, like um, 10 million or so in reach and in following across the social platforms. And I just realized that everyone says like the public dictates, like the social ether dictates what, um, what brands and platforms and media are putting out there. And at first I thought that was true. Like our articles that would do the best on vote.com were about what Kim Kardashian was wearing on date night. And then I, after building and launching that social and digital voice with the team there, I realized that we were entering an age of content pollution, just like there's noise pollution, there's air pollution. We were entering the age of content pollution because actually if you're an influencer, if you have a platform, if you're a media like Vogue, you can dictate what other people are consuming. It's not like the other way around. And we were kind of, everyone was losing that power to just kind of get like the clickbait and like the quick views and the quick shares. Um, and we were just like losing the essence of storytelling and, and I, we were just entering content pollution, just like we don't, we didn't know a decade ago how light pollution was going to affect us physically. I don't think we truly understand the impact of content pollution, um, having thousands of content infiltrated into our subconscious and into our mental health. Like we don't know how long-term that's going to affect us as a human in our evolution and our, how we think and function and also how it's going to affect not only mental health, which is why we see like mental health in the younger generation being, they have like the highest depression and suicidal rates. So anyways, long, basically the ev evolution of it has become that I want to focus on conscious content, which is intentional. And there's a reason for me putting it out there instead of, again, um, ego, fame, et cetera. S a few things that Blair mentioned as well. Um, and just information that I think is necessary, but also unites us instead of polarizes us even more. Yeah, and I'm super eager to hear you talk a little bit further on about some of the issues you've been campaigning for most recently, which are obviously very, very close to home. Um, Doina, how about you? How did your, I think yours is maybe a little bit different in terms of how your platform started and how it's evolved. Um, I think it is also because I'm pretty sure maybe I'm the oldest in terms of my, let's say, social media age. I think I started over 10 years ago. And for me, it, it didn't really come from a noble place or anything. I was a 
teenager, I was living in a tiny country in Eastern Europe where I was born. So for me, it was more a way to self-express, a way to connect with people abroad. I was also studying English and trying to get into um, my A-levels in England. So it was really like a way to practice my English and connect with people. And I started my blog and that was kind of where it all slowly started happening. But never when I started my blog, never did I imagine that I would be where I am today, you know, making a living out of this and turning this into my job. And then later on having this passion for sustainability and, you know, being here today and speaking with all of you. That's great. Thank you. So you're a model by trade um, and some of your platform you use to focus on circular fashion and plastic pollution, as well as some of the content that you do around fashion. Um, And you're an ambassador for No More Plastic. Why is this cause in particular important to you? And what have you found is the most effective way to talk to your audience about it? It's a good question to ask why, but honestly, I think just like with everything, you know, sometimes just something clicks with you. And I think that happened with me in plastic. And I think it happened when I was in Bali a few years ago on a holiday and we were on the kind of less touristy side of Bali was the Northern side of Bali. And I went to the beach and I was shocked by how much plastic there was everywhere. And honestly, it was such a reality kind of check because you imagine Bali as this paradise untouched, which it is. However, even though it's paradise, it's still touched by our pollution throughout the whole world. So I think being there and seeing that really kind of shocked me. And I remember crying. And that was kind of the moment, even though I'd always been interested in pollution and the world, I think, you know, being in Europe or say Western countries, um, it's easy to sort of hear about the pollution problem, but you never quite see it also because so much of the recycling gets exported into Asia, etc. So you kind of hear of this plastic pollution, but you know, you walk down the street and you don't really see it. So it's almost easy to convince yourself that it doesn't exist. So that was the moment when I was like, oh my God, this is real and I need to do something about it. So that was really the first thing that clicked with me and I got super interested about it and I started researching, became obsessed. But very much like Blair mentioned before, I think, you know, the most important thing is communicating in a very easy manner. And that was kind of my way of approaching it because I was no expert. I was just learning about it. So I tried to take this learning process to my social media and my followers. And it was almost like, let's learn together. I don't know about everything, but let's discover this stuff together. And again, it's about that easy language, easy communication. To me, admitting that you're not perfect because nobody is and kind of taking it from there and taking your followers on a journey. That's, yeah, I I think that the strategies question is a big one I would love to talk about, right? There's so many complex issues that um, are so important to the future of the planet, the future of people. Um, And so, Sophia and Blair, I'd love to hear from you next. You know, you both take very complicated topics and break them down in a simple way. You use multiple forms of media to communicate your messages as well. Can you talk a bit about not just your goals, but what what is the the strategies that you employ to be able to take these really complex topics or in some cases, what I wouldn't perceive as controversial, but seem to be controversial out there in the world, right? Um, And effectively communicate them. Sophia, do you want to kick off on that one? Uh, Sure. So... um... I think one of the strategies is realizing that in this day and age, we all want to be either right. We all want to be right. So when we're fighting on the internet, it's like, it's like, there's no healthy debates anymore because it's like, I'm right and you're wrong. And you know, that's like what cancel culture is and that's all. And what I'm trying to communicate, and I guess it could be a strategy is being like, um, one, there doesn't have to be this like polarization of binary, like you're right or wrong in the sustainability space. It's not good or bad. It's like, you know, a spectrum of solutions. And first off, we can't unite on fighting the climate crisis or fighting systemic racism, et cetera, if we're not unified on the end goal, instead of having this horizontal hostility where we're spending our energy fighting to be I'm right. um, Let's communicate to align and unify on who the bigger enemy is and then 
go above that and attack that and work together collect like collectively and collaboratively to approach the bigger enemy at large and this is all very um uh it's it's hard to we, we could use specific examples but i think that's like kind of how cult cancel culture polarization that's all playing out especially in digital media today and if you ask me what the biggest problem the biggest issue facing humanity today i wouldn't say covid or racism or the climate crisis i would say the polarization because if we can't unify on all those things then we can't fight them at the end of the day it's so easy to uh for all of us to gra to gravitate to our bubbles and be in these echo chambers and then uh and then when confronted right with a completely opposite point of view some people have so much trouble even being open to that because you're so ingrained in your own bubble um Blair, can you speak to the, what are the strategies that you employ? Because you cover a diverse range of topics in, um, in, in on your platforms. Certainly. I think that um, kind of from like a sociological standpoint as well, it's understanding that with identity formation, we understand ourselves as people, right? And as like, you know, unified entities and the things that we know in the same way. So what we know we treat as ourselves. So when we, ch so when that's challenged, we feel challenged, like in a very visceral manner in some cases. Like it's almost as if somebody's saying that you don't deserve to exist if you challenge what somebody thinks to be true. Um, and so that's why I always say that learning is very vulnerable. And so I try to make it as like warm and fuzzy as possible without losing meaning. And so sometimes that can be accomplished through like visual aspects, uh, through captioning, through humor. And I'll use a, an example. So I have a series called Smarter in Seconds on Instagram Reels. And I first didn't think it would take off the way that it did. And some of the best projects are like that. Um, but I was just having fun with it, which helped me be really uh, experimental. And so all my lessons are in 30 seconds or less, uh, smarter in seconds, literally. And I can compact increasingly like large amounts of information into that small package as I go. And so I'll just kind of have like a big issue, like um, white supremacy, pronouns, these different uh, concepts. And I'm just trying to think about like, what are the top things that I want somebody to know in 30 seconds? Because the whole appeal of this is that if your friend or family member asks you to watch this and you don't have 30 seconds, come on, everybody has 30 seconds. And so I try to like maximize that. But I did a lesson recently on uh, Abraham Lincoln and that one went super well on uh, Instagram. I posted on TikTok and it did super well there as well. And it was basically talking about how Abraham Lincoln is racist, which is true. And I defined racist. A racist is somebody who believes in a racial hi hierarchy of different racial groups but you don't have to take my word for it, take his. And I just put myself in Abraham Lincoln drag where I turned my hijab into a hijab beard and a top hat. And I basically broke down his own words and did like a little Abraham Lincoln voice. And I think that the shock visually of somebody seeing me be Abraham Lincoln in beautiful eyeshadow and lipstick with a hijab beard was so comical that people were able to kind of like be receptive. Cause once you laugh at something, you're more open to it. Um, and that can be used for good or for bad. And so in this case it was used for good. And I also didn't say claim about Abraham Lincoln. I just found his own quotes and just had my little Abraham Lincoln character say those quotes. And so at the end of it, it was like, well, if a racist is somebody who believes in a racial hierarchy, and Abraham Lincoln literally said, there has to be a position of superior and inferior, and I'm in favor of the superior position being assigned to the white race, you really can't argue with that. Uh, and so then I had said another thing about how he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, yes. And the strategy behind that is to figure out what people are gonna refute immediately. Well, he ended slavery, yes, a fact, but also the week before he ended slavery, he said that black people and white people should be separate, which is racist. And so, and then I end it with, yes, he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but he was still a racist. That's just my two cents. And I hold up two pennies and I drop them. So it's kind of an aspect of performance in there. It's an aspect of, um, you know, messaging and sociology in there, all for a 30 second lesson that's visually in interesting, that's going to appeal to people who are vehemently, uh, you know, pro Lincoln to folks who are just kind of like, I don't really think about Lincoln on a daily basis, but I guess it's important to recognize that if you were around during enslavement, it's a high likelihood that you're racist. Um, 
And the point of this lesson was one, I have a bone to pick with Lincoln personally, but also <laughs> because I think it's important that we start to interrogate our uh, leaders and look at them critically as whole people, not just as the you know shiny veneer that we want to have in American history. So it's kind of this end game that I have that we're getting at, but also ways to do it in a way that feels uh, exciting so that folks want to learn more. So there's so many strategies that go into it, whether it's the lesson I did on abortion, for example. I know it's a hot topic issue. I wore gray, which visually calms people but I wore bright uh, pink or bright red lipstick to feminize myself so to lean into that um, you know bias against not arguing with women which is a thing on the internet as we all know um, I also didn't wear my traditional hijab because for some people there's a cognitive dissonance of somebody who's a feminist who also wears hijab so I took that out of the equation to create less psychological barriers to that information being extended and that lesson was less controversial than a lesson I did on the monarchy in an English accent um, which is interesting right who would imagine that a lesson on abortion would be less controversial than a lesson on the monarchy where I'm in like full queen drag you just can never anticipate these things <laughs> but um, it's the work that goes behind into it and it's because I have a background in message training it's because I have a background in crisis communications and my partner studies uh, is, had just graduated in performance studies and that goes into my work too but all people see is this 30 second enjoyable lesson but I'm curating the experience for them so that they'll be receptive to the information that's important for them to know. I think it's incredible to hear all of the thought that goes into a post, right? Because when somebody's just swiping through their Instagram, you know, they're not thinking about the amount of time. And I'm, I'm hearing you say humor. I'm hearing you say performance, sociology, psychology, critical thinking as well, thinking through what are the counter arguments that might come out of this um, that I can immediately respond to. Um, that's all really, I mean, that's a toolkit right there. Um, there are some uh, responses, though, that are just hate that come through on these platforms. And I know that um, I know that both Sophia and Blair have been victims of this. Duane, I don't know if you have as well, but I wonder um, if you guys can speak a little bit to um, how you're staying safe and healthy on these platforms. Um, how have others in the online communities supported you? I don't want to give time and space to those messages, I would much prefer to hear how you're able to keep going and, um, and, and how others on there can, can support you. So Blair, I don't know if you would, you'd be willing to go first on that one. Certainly. And I think what Sophia was saying earlier is very wise, which is fun because Sophia means wisdom. Um, and it's like, there's the lateral violence, which I feel like is so much more threatening. And of course, just people who just have no interest in humanizing you whatsoever. I can generally put those in a bucket and say, okay, is this person making a credible th threat? And a credible threat is generally when it's like they have a plan, they know who you are, they have a method, and they're expressing that to you uh, in order to convey that threat to you. In that case, that's something where like, you know, potentially law enforcement or a different type of support system has to come into play. But the thing where it's like somebody who's in your community and they're hating at you, or you have the same progressive goals and they're hating on you, then it has to be discerning, okay, what is a valid critique, even if it's not packaged in the most nice way, or you feel disrespected? Is there anything from this that I need to be attuned to? And so recently, I was called out, and I wasn't even tagged in the call out. So I didn't see it till one of my followers screenshotted somebody else's story and sent it to me. And at the same time, I'm being told that I'm silencing folks, but I didn't even see what the critique was. And and there was some valid critique there about inappropriately centering myself in a conversation that doesn't directly harm me. Uh, and so I was able to take steps back on that and, you know, be accountable to that. And accountable just means, you know, taking ownership of your responsibility. But I think oftentimes accountable is misunderstood to mean punish yourself until you no longer exist or, you know, disappear. And those are the harder things. And so what I realized is um, when people come at you, sometimes it's with their own expectations that you're not going to listen. It's your own, their own expectations that you don't care. Um, and sometimes the hate, for example, uh, recently I posted um, something with Dove and Dove is working really hard on sustainability, on anti-racism. Um, I didn't, I wouldn't say they're a sustainable company, but they do have recycling and they are making progress toward that goal, but they're giant, they're a giant corporation. Um, but immediately I was being attacked because there's sulfates in the soap. Uh, and of course that assumes that I also have an issue with that and just all these assumptions. And so as an educator, I wanna be able to parse through and come to a conclusion with somebody where it's like, hey, you're being a jerk. Sometimes I don't say that initially. I'm like, hey, are there questions that I can answer? Are there assumptions I can help to demystify? Um, can we go on a learning journey together when I really wanted to say you're being a jerk? Um, and generally 
uh, it takes, you know, additional time to DM people and to make them recognize that you're a person too, and to take a step back. Um, and also to remind them that expecting perfection from women is a patriarchal lie that is super harmful. Um, and expecting that from folks from other marginalized groups is also harmful. It feeds into white supremacy, it feeds into patriarchy. And so I'm generally able to come to consensus with people, but some folks are just bullies. And you can tell when somebody's bullying you, if they had no other connection to you, they're just saying lies and rude things about you. And they're couching it in language that's progressive because bullies can use progressive language too and so sometimes it just takes logging off sometimes it takes me checking in with my mental health and recently I had to get on like tranquilizers because I was so like just chaotic about it and so just figuring out what you need to be in a place of wholeness and remembering that it's not a matter of just logging off that makes the anxiety go away you have to do whatever it takes in your support system and have people who love you regardless of how well your posts are doing or regardless how many followers you have. Because if you don't have that, you live on such a fragile foundation of self-understanding and actualization. Thank you, Blair. That's, that's, really, um, that's really powerful. Those are all incredible. And um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it is... Uh, I'm grateful for the work that you do because you don't have to, and you don't have to put up with, you know, what, what comes at you and that you have such wisdom about it um, in, a, in a space that's constantly evolving. It's just such kudos to you. Sophia, how about you? I know in particular this past few weeks has probably been incredibly difficult. I've seen on your platform. Um, how are you holding up? Thank you, Natalie. Um, yeah. I mean, it's been super heavy, of course, for the AAPI community. Um, and I think some of the biggest outlets that have helped are actually the communities that also have been oppressed. Like all my black friends, my, like all my friends who have gone through the same journey, they have been like the biggest supporters and communities. And I said this on Instagram is that when a systemic institution destroys your community, whether it be white supremacy, systemic racism, capitalism, even it's not those institutions or the governments that pick you guys back up. It's like literally your brothers and sisters who pick you back up. So it's like, it just reaffirms the fact that like, we don't even need what we think of like systemic racism, capitalism, governments, like all of these, they're not going to be our end all be all. They're not also not going to even be our flotation safety device like they will only destroy us and it reaffirms that we don't even need them in the way that they're structured um I think what's what really important when these hate messages come in is recognizing like one me recognizing that I'm not here to be an influencer that people like I, I'm not even I don't even call myself an influencer like my full-time job is truly being a multimedia journalist and I don't even need my social platform to continue my livelihood my career etc and it's great to have this platform and I feel very responsible for it as mighty and small as it may be um but knowing that you know that's something when these hate messages come in I'm like I'm I do my research I um have that journalistic sense that's my background so if and I'm trying to communicate in a way that's accessible but if that triggers you like that's actually not for me to take on your emotional responsibility or emotional labor for you to go through that journey if you're feeling triggered by certain words or certain topics like that's actually not on me that's on you and that's fine um and also understanding that you know like I would even say if, if, if I'm ever influencer, it, I would rather be dubbed as an ideas influencer rather than anything else. Um, and also it goes back to this mindset of how we always think about, we always think about things in very binary ways. Like racism is only if it's black and white. I'm anti-Asian if I only push someone down in the streets and to their death. But it's like, actually, there's so many, we're byproducts of institutions that uphold white supremacy, that uphold patriarchy, that uphold systemic racism. So we're byproducts of that. Like we have so much subconsciousness about us that, that exhibit in small ways. And when, when these things happen, it's almost like I, I don't even 
it's there it's a journey to understand the spectrum that goes into these things so if if it's especially someone from my community in the sustainability or climate or whatever space saying oh you worked with adidas um and adidas have maybe um labor exploitation and yeah yet adidas is sponsoring this documentary i'm doing on landfills in the world and that's really you know like it's like we need to get out of this system. Like, I just think purism and absolutism, that's kind of like the enemy. And we, no one is purist. No one's absolutism. No one is zero waste. No one is zero carbon footprint. Like the fact that I'm alive and breathing out carbon dioxide right now, the fact that I have to live it. I mean, not that I have to, but I'm, you know, wearing clothes because I don't want to be naked. And that's the societal institution. Like we, at the end of the day, live and function in these institutions. So we cannot be purists and absolutism in our thinking. And for me, I never want to claim that I'm perfect. Um, I always try to show the spectrum. I always try to show, okay, yes, this company has X, Y, Z, but also they're trying to do X, Y, Z. It's just like, they can coexist. Like they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And at the end of the day, um, companies or brands, they could keep supporting, they could keep producing at the level they're producing, or they could also be funding this education and these movements. And I would rather have that, like that is the first step. And so I think the purism absolutism, I'm like, okay, that's your, also your own journey. And and it's just different approaches. And I actually think it's healthy and acceptable to be like, all of these approaches can exist. It doesn't have to be my way or the highway. Yes. Amen. Um, I think about this a lot when someone asks me, is this company sustainable or not? There's no such thing. <laughs> Sustainability is a paradigm. It's a constantly moving target, right? Um, there are some brands who are doing things different than others. Absolutely. Um, so this is a perfect segue into the next question. And thank you. Thank you guys for sharing on that, that topic. Cause I know it's, um, it can be a difficult one. Um, as a content creator, there are so many opportunities to partner with brands and organizations. I know that you're inundated probably on a daily basis. How do you go about vetting partnerships? Do you have a vetting process? Um, how do you decide who you'll work with? Um, Joanna, do you want to take this one first? Sure. And I actually liked what you said about, is this a sustainable brand? And it's, it's such a funny question because I think the reality is if we're being honest to ourselves, is this a sustainable brand? It's like the lack of a brand would be a sustainable brand because every, let's say company brand creation of products out there um, is a way is in one way or another contributing to you know climate the climate crisis and waste and it's a, it's a carbon footprint etc so of course there is no and just like you know the ladies have mentioned before there's absolutely no way of being perfect or there is no way of you know working with someone who is a hundred percent sustainable or hundred percent perfect but it is about I think being honest with yourself, first of all, I think for me, that's been kind of the main goal. It's been about kind of, you know, talking to myself, what, what do you want to achieve by working with a brand? Um, is this a brand you generally want to work with or are you just doing it for the money? If you're doing it for the money, will you be happy afterwards? And I think if you're people like us, and I think, you know, Blair and Sophia will probably agree you, you can't just take money and, and then be done with it. I wish I was like that sometimes. <laughs> it's like, you you know, you overthink it and you want it to be something where when you're alone, you know that in your soul, like it's all fine with you and you're not kind of having this inner battle with yourself that you're doing something that you don't fully agree with or things like that. But uh, that being said, at the same time, you also can't just... work with 100% pure brands because it just doesn't exist. And sometimes you have to sort of not necessarily sacrifice your values, but um, reevaluate, you know, in the long term, working with a bigger corporation, you know, like like you mentioned, is it Dove? Is it Adidas? Is it, uh, I don't know, H&M? Is it, is it going to actually maybe promote the idea of sustainability of other ethical, um, ethical, uh, 
I'm losing the world uh, of other kind of principles that you want to be pushed out there because you know if, if it's one certain message that you want to be out there maybe it's about the big companies endorsing it and then other big companies are joining that and then turning it into a trend almost which you know a few years ago which have said greenwashing greenwashing or you know they're just doing this for the PR but then after noticing and kind of observing the brands working on big projects whether on sustainability or other things it everyone is kind of looking at each other so if one big brand is doing something within sustainability the other brands feel like they're missing out if they're not and suddenly they're all these brands doing it okay just for the PR but then it's pushing this message to the consumer so suddenly the consumer learns that oh, you know, there are more sustainable products. Actually, sustainability is a thing. So they start looking into it and then more brands are fighting for which one is doing more for sustainability. So what starts as greenwashing can actually slowly become a norm in the supply chain. So it's, you know, it's a complicated matter. And, and I think like just sort of like Sophia said, existing today and wanting to be sustainable is basically being a hypocrite because, you know, you want to be sustainable, but just... By existing, you can't be sustainable. So it's it's hard. And I think for myself, I definitely reject a lot of work. I'd say about 80% of the of the kind of projects that I that I have coming my way. Um, and it's not necessarily always just because it's not a sustainable project. Sometimes I want more than just one off endorsement. I want to work from the creative process. I want to do the photography. I want to do the creative direction. Um, otherwise it just, you know, it doesn't bring me pleasure. That's, that's fantastic. And I think a, a point that you just touched on too is so often the backlash is on the creators. Why did you partner with this brand? Why did you partner with that brand? Why is the conversation not about why is this brand doing this? Why isn't there a conversation directly with the brand? Blair, I don't know if you have, I know you oh, have a thought process. I have thoughts. I find that yeah. to be so frustrating because a lot of times in the contracts, you can't keep up negative comments. And it's also really frustrating to me because what I tend to see is it's folks who are themselves going through a journey of learning where they did not talk about racism before June 1st, 2020. And yet I'm being held to a purity standard. If I was that type of person, you wouldn't be allowed on my page. You wouldn't be allowed to learn with me. I would have canceled you already. And it's not the case. I think it's just, there's so much missed like there's uh just it's so mystified like oh if you're working with the company you must be best friends with the ceo if you're working with the company they must care about everything you have to say mm -hmm. um and i think that that again it's like what sophia was saying with the binaries it's not that case but it's also the case that we are being hired and that they are seeking something in us and so we can push back on certain things as creators and that's what i've been trying to like help mobilize folks to do on the back end like if there's a policy that doesn't work for folks across shade diversity you need to push back on that uh, especially if you're in a position of privilege where they're reaching out to you. But as it relates to the sustainability aspect, I spend a significant amount of time vetting companies. Sometimes it'll be like, I can't say which company this is, but it was a shoe company and they reached out to me and uh, my agent, you know, I think sometimes uh, influencers will rely on their agents to vet things for them, but your agent's job is to present every opportunity to you, whether or not it makes total sense for you. And even my agent will send me something and be like, Blair, I'm sure you're going to say no to this, but I just have to you know, and sometimes I'll use it as a learning moment so that they know why I said no. So they'll have a better, you know, understanding of where my direction is going. So I've only been doing this for six months. Um, and so in this, the shoe company, they're clearly a fast fashion company. They've clearly, they're not new. They've been around for a minute, um, but they're projecting, presenting themselves like they're new and indie. And it was frustrating to me because Three years ago, the CEO had done an interview about how global warming is helping to make them, you know, a billion dollar company. And how do you go from that to three years later being leaders in sustainability? Like it can happen, but I don't want to be the diverse person they bring in to greenwash them, especially when they have other issues like that company. I went to their and I found this from their own investors report. Um, they had just started employee relations uh, organizations or, you know, employee resource groups, which is like the bare minimum of retention and honoring your employees. They cut workers at part time uh, to save less than a million dollars um, in money during the beginning of the pandemic. They could have made a million less and their investors would have been just as happy and they could have taken a humanistic approach, but they didn't. They're also very anti-union, which is exemplified by the fact that they just had these things. And their first sustainability report came out the same year that they are leaders in sustainability. So there's a lot of nonsense that's going on quite clearly. And it's about how do 
you figure your ethics in it. And so I talked to some of my friends in the sustainability space and a lot of folks were like, well, this is good. Now they're going to be changing things. This is going to be popular. And, and just like you were saying, but at the same time, with that context of how they're bad to their workers and how they are, you know, falsely positioning themselves, that's when I have to be like, oh, I call BS. And I can't always be like, hey, folks, watch out for these folks. They suck, um, especially because contracts are involved. Like, I can't even really comfortably mention them without feeling like I'm going to have some type of legal action. But all these things are found in their investors reports. Um, and so it's about really looking critically and going beyond, because if you just did a Google search, like my first Google search in the company, everything was fine. But in their own employee, in, in their own investor relations thing, then I'm like, OK, wait, what? Y'all cut people's jobs during the beginning of the pandemic so you could save less than a million dollars? Like, that's just not a company I want to align myself with. And sometimes it comes down to that. Uh, at the same time, it's looking at companies who maybe didn't do great in the past, like Dove. I've personally called out Dove for their, like, kind of misguided approaches to racism. And once I felt like they did make those changes, then it's kind of making your own judgment call on, okay, are they actually being meaningful? And that looks different for everybody. But what I really get frustrated with is, like I said at the beginning, folks feeling like if they come at the company in my comment section that it's going to harm anybody but me because what it ends up doing is harming my potential to work with other companies my potential to be innovative in other ways um and it's not the case that i can always go out and tell folks hey i said no to a bunch of money today y'all i'm really ethical because that comes off as performative but mm -hmm. it's just hoping to curate an experience with your community where they feel like you're doing the right thing even when you're not online i love that you're in their 10ks <laughs> like you are digging into the financials. That's amazing. Um, and it speaks to the research that you do in, in terms of all of your posts. But I think that, uh, you know, we're talking about issues sort of broadly, right? And we could spend hours going into each of these topics that you all cover. The point is that there is so much more underneath the surface that we all need to read and learn about and not spend so much time just, you know, immediately reacting and commenting and, and sort of coming from our own identity, right? Um, I want to wrap up with um, one, one more question um, for all of you, which is how do you think that online communities and platforms can evolve? Where do they need to go to? How do they need to change in the next five years um, so that there are more, I mean, my hope is that there are more creators like you out there in the world, um, what I would call ethical creators, but what do you all think? Sophia, do you want to kick off? Sure. Um, well, I think that when we were, when you said platforms and communities, that's super important to identify because I don't think our brains were made in a way where we could watch even 200 people's daily lives and stories and everything that's going on in everyday life. Like we, like we're not meant to hold space for that day in and day out for years to come and decades to come. So I think like um, the platforms and communities, those would be super powerful because they are representing the zeitgeist and also showing like that when I was saying um, media platform bases off of what public is, what the public is saying, but actually like the, like, you know, like I think media brands and magazines, like all that it's becoming, they're building their own communities and platforms, but like people in itself, like Blair and Doña, like they are their own platforms and communities in itself. Um, there are their own media brands in itself. And I think not everyone, like we're, we're not supposed to live in a world where everyone is meant to be an influencer. It's just like, if everyone's an influencer, then no one's an influencer, right? Um, so, and also there's a lot of studies of they're asking children in school now, like what their top three pr professions they want to be when they grow up. And it's like a YouTube creator, an influencer, or just famous just around that. And I just think that as we go into a, even a more democratized digitized space is like those communities and those specific platforms for very specific kinds of ways of pushing thought processes pushing the way we view the world that's important and to belong to a community or platform instead of thinking I myself need to be the one that's like the influencer and um I just think that the more that this becomes common the more content pollution we'll see the more you know like it's just gonna like it's just gonna become more and more where 
we need to then it will probably go to this breaking point where we then need to be like, okay, this is what is best for me to understand the world and how to keep processing. Um, I don't know if that makes sense because it's all very hypothetical, but I think, I don't think we can continue on in, in this way. And the communities and platforms will be one of the biggest answers. We face an uncertain future on many fronts, I think. It's very hard to know um, how things are going to evolve. Joanna, how about you? How do you think that in a best case scenario, these communities and platforms can evolve for, for positive influence and change? I agree with Sophia on the topic of communities. And I think especially with giants like Facebook, um, really kind of changing their platforms to discourage creators from natural growth and organic interactions and really bringing in all the ad spacing and kind of bullying small creators out of uh, their pre-existing followers, the community itself is really going to play a role. And that is through kind of supporting the creators that they like by sharing their posts, by liking, by commenting, by interacting, and talent in between influencers, uh, etc. commenting, liking, sharing each other's posts and so on and so forth, because I think we're really stepping into a period where all of us will sort of be, be losing our existing engagement and not actually reach the followers we already have. And I think that's kind of the next step of what we're going to go against. It's actually going to be kind of the big tech companies. Um, but also I think interactive content, and it's exactly what Blair was talking about, and it's exactly why I'm spending so much time on TikTok. Um, and that's very much, you know, easy video content. And I really believe that the future, I mean, the present already is video. Sorry, that's a tram on my street. <laughs> the present already is so video kind of um, driven, but I think the future really will be about video, whether it's shoppable uh, videos, shoppable interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And I think kind of investing your time in that, whether you're a small brand or a small creator is really going to pay off down the line and being unique. I mean, it's always been the case, but I think especially now as we've touched on kind of the content saturation, um, I think it's content pollution. It's, it's going to really play a role kind of being different and having a different angle. Thank you, Joanna. And Blair, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. Thank you. I think that there's a few things that are on like my wish list of the future for content creation. Like it's interesting to hear that young people wanting wanting to do these things. I hear in my spaces like young people want to be activists, they want to be content creators, they want to be influencers. And I think what that speaks to is they want to make things that people resonate with and they want to be effective in creating the change they want to see. And they're only used to seeing that in a few limited ways. And so when I do these exercises with young people, I try to dive in to what does that mean? You wanna be an artist, awesome. What do you like doing? Is it digital art? Is it oil paints? Like, what do you like doing? Um, and matching those things up and going into this idea of uniqueness that Joanna just said, it's those things that make you so weird. <laughs> like the things that I do well, talking really fast and having a big mouth, those are the things that made me have the successful smarter in seconds. And so it's leaning into those things that keep you outside the box and putting yourself in into a position where you're not only comfortable with yourself, but you're able to express that to other people and provide knowledge. There is a bit of ego that has to be demolished too in terms of this, realizing that sometimes we're not the best educators on a subject. Sometimes we're not the most versed person on this. And also sharing the space. I think that there's this whole myth about uh, particularly marginalized creators we, we do collaborate with each other, but how, do, how much do we do it in front of the camera? And so I've been having ridiculous growth right now because I'm using Reels, which is great for having growth on Instagram. And I've been collaborating, which is great for growth anywhere. And I've been collaborating on Reels. And it's been shaping people's understandings. I did a lesson on Down syndrome with folks who actually have Down syndrome and educate about Down syndrome, which helps folks to realize that they have a lot of ableist biases about who can be an educator. And so there's a lot of that that has to happen. And sharing space sometimes comes with realizing that if we share space, we don't lose space, we gain more. And finally, something that I think it has to happen, not only in the virtual space, but in the, you know, real flesh space is that um, we have to get to a space of understanding not only how we identify things that are bad, but how we realize how we can contribute to it. And so I think that when I see folks who have filters that, you know, on their page that, you know, make somebody's nose smaller and skin lighter, but then they talk about injustice that person has to eventually recognize how they're contributing to that person to, to, to racism. And so 
it's a harder step, but I really think that once we can get there, we'll have a more empathetic world because we won't be going around and saying, that's problematic, that's problematic, that's problematic. It'll be, hmm, let me meditate on the ways that I'm problematic and how I can stop from doing that. Because if everybody's taking care of their own business, then we're going to get free and we're not going to have to constantly check on each other about this stuff. But that's the harder thing. When I put out a new lesson, I'm immediately getting tagged in all types of other posts where one of my smarties is going, hey, this is problematic. I just learned this 10 seconds ago, but you should know this and shame on you for not knowing it. And they need to get to a space where they're like, okay, wait, how have I contributed to this? Not immediately. I'm going to be a warrior for this new thing that I've just learned, but that takes longer work. That's fantastic. (laughs) Um, So one quick, quick final question, because I'm actually really super curious to hear what is one account that you guys think is really worth following right now, apart from your own, uh, on whichever platform you like, uh, Blair, do you have an answer? Yes, I do. So Aja Barber has taught me so much what I know about sustainability. And I think what Joyne was saying about like the pre-existing followers, sometimes, uh, folks come into the space and they're praised more than the folks who've been doing it for longer. And so Aja Barber has been doing it for a minute. And so has Celine uh, Salman, Celine Celine's uh, at Slow Factory. So I would follow those two accounts because they do it in a really intersectional way. Um, and they have the experience and they are in a point, I think, in their careers where they are not mincing words. They're just saying yeah. the truth. Yeah, absolutely. They're both fantastic. They do not mince words and more power to them. How about you, Sophia? Um, I'm actually at Celine's house right now. <laughs> So I love that. I was going to say the slow factory, hundred percent, hands down, love supporting them. They're just, they say it how it is and they're very receptive to their own unlearning as well. Um, and then also Selena and I are launching something um, mid April and it will be AOTA.TV. So hopefully that will be a fun thing as well. Awesome. We look forward to seeing that. And doing that. Um, I think my favorite account at the moment, which is one that I've sent to my teenage sister as well, is Get Wasted on TikTok. And they basically just, they're an educative kind of sustainability driven low waste channel that I think now have gathered millions of followers. And what I love is that they do all these really easy to understand videos, basically like school almost videos like um that you know a huge amount of people interact with on tiktok uh that wouldn't normally care about sustainability and that was kind of how i got hooked up on them and that's um how i started reposting their stuff to instagram love it i'll check that out get wasted okay well thank you all so much uh for your time today and sharing your really your wisdom on a, a space and a a constantly evolving situation, quite frankly, and all of what you shared today is just so thoughtful. Um, So thank you for your your time. Um, Thank you to FIT for having all of us uh, at the Change Change Makers in Action Conference. Um, And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.